Donald Trump's defense files a mother load of motions to dismiss, among other filings, and we're going to go through them. Now, there are so many to attend to here that today we're going to be focusing on this one. The motion to dismiss for constitutional violations is a 31 pager, but when I saw this docket, I was pretty excited about it and I wanted to share it with you. Take a look at this. We've got a lot. If you go over to the actual court docket, here's what it says, U.S. versus Donald Trump, and we just had boom, 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 boom. We had a motion to dismiss for selective and vindictive prosecution. And we've got a main motion on that to dismiss the entire case because Jack Smith is a deranged thug. That comes with additional attachments. We've got a motion to strike the inflammatory allegations out of the indictment. Get rid of those. Another motion to dismiss based on the law. Another motion to dismiss based on the Constitution. And other responses by Donald Trump that are really leading to a lot of activity on this case. And we've been waiting for this for some time. And so we're, of course, going to be going through each of these in turn because this is a historical case. This is one of the cases that will, I think, define the future of America and it will be etched into the history books, no matter which way this thing goes. And so as we go through this, now today we're only focusing on the constitutional violations motion. So be sure you're subscribed if you want to make sure to get and catch the other filings when we get to those. But let's just get right into it. This is what has been filed. Now this one, 31 pages. This is Judge Chutkin's courtroom out of the District of Columbia. United States of America versus Donald Trump. And here Here's the filing. It says, President Trump's motion to dismiss the indictment based on constitutional grounds. You violated Donald Trump's constitutional rights as a citizen, as a former president, in many different varieties. Let's see. Judge's defense, Trump's defense opens. Your Honor, the prosecution in this case opens its indictment by stating that President Trump had a right like every American, to speak publicly about the election, what Jack Smith said, including his deeply held view that there had been fraud and other irregularities during the election that he had won. Trump people, they say, these points are not in dispute. We agree, he did have a right. But nonetheless, in an astonishing display of doublethink, Jack Smith deranged thugs and his prosecutors simultaneously claim that President Trump, simply by speaking his mind and by petitioning for a redress of grievances that we thought was protected under the Constitution, Constitution, also somehow conspired to, quote, defraud the United States and to oppress rights and to obstruct an official proceeding by doing those things, by simply speaking his mind. Now, attempting to explain this obvious contradiction, the prosecution argues that there was no outcome determinative fraud in the election, in parentheses, their words, not mine, whatever that means. I know it's hard to disambiguate that because sometimes that sounds like me, sounds like something, I, pff, whatever that means. But no, they put that in the motion. There was no outcome determinative determinative fraud in the election, whatever that means. And that President Trump supposedly knew this because some government officials, quote, notified him that his claims were untrue. Okay, you know, Bill Barr comes over, you know, Donald Trump, you know, he's waddling his way over there and sits down with Trump and he says, oh, we've done our due diligence and the DOJ says there's no fraud. Trump says, thanks, Bill, get the hell out of my office. So the defense says, now, if there is any constant in our democratic system of government, it is that the marketplace of ideas, not the mandates of of government functionaries or partisan prosecutors, that determines the public debate scope. The marketplace of ideas determines what we do, not government bureaucrats. They say countless millions believe, as President Trump consistently has and currently does, that fraud and irregularities pervaded the 2020 presidential election. And as the indictment itself alleges, President Trump gave voice to those concerns and demanded that politicians in a position to restore integrity to our our elections, not just talk about the problem, but also to investigate it and resolve it. They say that the First Amendment embraces and encourages exactly this kind of behavior. That's why we have it. And therefore, they state it in the clearest of terms, and they are in the First Amendment that, quote, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. United States Constitution, First Amendment. The indictment taken as true if we say Jack Smith is honest and accurate and not a deranged thug. I know it's difficult to do. If taken as true, the indictment itself violates this core principle as to each count. Accordingly, the court should dismiss this indictment in its entirety. They say now additionally, Judge Chutkin, as the United States Senate has previously tried and acquitted President Trump for charges arising from the same course of conduct alleged in this indictment, the impeachment and the double jeopardy clauses both bar retrial before this court and they require dismissal. He's being prosecuted again for conduct that he's already been prosecuted for in the United States Senate, and he was acquitted there. So just like you can't be charged twice for
for the same crime under the double jeopardy provisions, same concept applies. They say, finally, because our country's long-standing tradition of forceful political advocacy about perceived fraud and irregularities in numerous presidential elections, President Trump lacked fair notice that his advocacy in this instance could be criminalized. Thus, the court should dismiss this indictment under the due process clause as well. Due process is the idea that the government can't act and do things against you without you being afforded proper process. So if they're going to arrest you, right, or interrogate you, those are being protected. That's part of giving you due process to make sure you know about your rights. So the same thing happens here. If Trump doesn't have notice of the law, right, you just can't criminalize something. Hey, just pass a law. It's illegal to make a left-hand turn after 4 p.m. And then the cops just sit outside. Everybody who makes a left-hand turn gets arrested. You're like, what? We had no notice. That's a violation of due process. And by the way, they used to do that, okay? Something you did, you're arrested. Why? The law changed. What? It's now illegal to be a shopkeeper here, okay? So it was a big part of this. And Trump was doing and saying the same thing that a lot of other Democrats were doing. Fight like hell. We had, you know, that ranting psycho from California, I think. You know, many of them. I know it's hard to keep track. But, you know, screaming and shouting, get in their faces, fight. And, you know, Hakeem Jeffries was objecting to the elections and of Trump and they all did the same thing, right? So if they didn't get prosecuted and Trump was doing the same things, he should not get prosecuted either. They say, Your Honor, here's some of our argument. They say, President Trump fully denies the allegation in the indictment, which are referenced here, and we think this is sufficient to dismiss this entire case. Here's why. First and foremost, they say Jack Smith's indictment must be dismissed because it seeks to criminalize core political speech and advocacy that lies at the heart of the First Amendment. In other cases, the Supreme Court has confirmed that we have a broad scope of the First Amendment in this country, and it protects even the verifiably false claim that the speaker had been awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Okay, somebody came in, I got a Congressional Medal of Honor, turns out he didn't, lied about it, but he's allowed to say it. That was a plurality opinion. It produced multiple opinions, but on one key point, all nine justices were unanimous. They said, under the First Amendment 9 to 0, the government may not prohibit or criminalize speech on disputed social, political, or historical issues simply because the government determines that some views are true and others are false. Our constitutional traditions stand against the idea that we need Oceana's Ministry of Truth. That's from George Orwell's 1984. So you're allowed to have a different opinion than your bureaucratic useless government. Our Supreme Court said that nine to zero. Now the four justice plurality, okay, this is where the justices have kind of a different opinion. We're used to hearing opinions like seven to two or, you know, five to four or nine to zero. But sometimes what'll happen is you'll get these plurality opinions where there will be like three or four issues in a case. We'll have like a free speech issue. We'll have like a due process issue. We'll have an equal protection issue, whatever. And in the court, the judges will split on those and those, or there'll be one issue and they say, well, we kind of think this way, but this or this, and it's really complicated. And so what it makes actually very difficult for lawyers to tease out of that, what it all means. And so they're telling us, well, four judges, they agreed with this. They said they were emphatic on this point. So four of them, nine of them agreed on this one issue that you can't criminalize speech based on government dictated truths. And another four of them, they rejected the notion that government may decree that this speech about receiving medals to be criminal. Now, whether it's shouted from the rooftops or made barely audible, such an approach would endorse the government authority to compile a list of subjects about which false statements are punishable. Okay, so if that guy is charged with lying about his Medal of Honor, the government can say, that is our truth. You can't challenge our truth. And that leads to a big problem. It says the government has no clear limiting principle. We protect free speech that much. So disavowing Oceana's Ministry of Truth, Justice Kennedy rejected any rule that would give the government a broad censor power, unprecedented in this court's cases or in our constitutional tradition, saying that the mere potential for the exercise of that power casts a chill, a chill that the First Amendment cannot permit if free speech, if free thought and discourse are likely to remain the foundation of our freedom. Here, now, you know, it's just amazing when we used to think like this. The remedy for speech that is false is speech that is true. See how easy that is? Very simple, not even complicated. Now we need disinformation boards and now we need big governmental laws that censor people. We need Elvis Chan from the FBI snooping in your DMs on X or the White House doing the same thing, which they're now allowed to do thanks to the SCOTUS. We made a video about that in another segment. Very simple. We don't need to be censored. We don't need people to tell us what's true or not. If people are posting misinformation from video games about exposing 
explosions in the Middle East? That's fine. Let them post it. Post a response to that. That's true. And those people who are posting misinfo eventually will be found out for what they are. Now, this is the ordinary course in a free society. Would have been nice if our government had listened to this concept back during COVID and before. Now, the response to the unreasoned is the rational. Simple. Doesn't make sense. Just rationalize it away. To the uninformed, the enlightened. To the straight out lie, the simple truth. The theory of our constitution is that the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. Freedom of speech and thought flows not from the beneficence of the state, not thanks to the government giving us our freedom, but from the inalienable rights of the person. They are your rights and they cannot take them away. And when the FBI says that your content is dangerous to the America for whatever reason or to their narrative, that is them violating not only your constitutional rights, but your inalienable rights as a person, as a human being. And suppression of speech by the government can make exposure of falsity more difficult, not less so. When the government gets in and meddles, we have worse information, not better. These ends are not well served when the government seeks to orchestrate public discussion through content-based mandates. Good comments there. They say, now only a weak society needs government protection or intervention before it pursues its resolve to preserve the truth. That's why we call many who want to do this censors and cowards and bullies because it's weakness. They're weak. Their ideas can't survive in the marketplace of ideas, so they have no choice but to act like pathetic weaklings. Truth neither needs handcuffs nor a badge for its vindication. The truth shall set you free. All common jurisprudence and accepted in our country for 230 years. Now, Justice Breyer's two justice concurrence in Alvarez likewise endorsed this point, and Justice Alito said there are broad areas in which any attempt by the state to penalize purportedly false speech would prevent a grave and unacceptable danger to suppressing truthful speech. Now, these topics, which are often the subject of vigorous public debate, rarely have clear or verifiable answers. That's the point of the controversy. That's why we need free speech. That's why citizens must be given breathing room to speak their minds without fear of being criminally prosecuted by deranged thugs. Breyer also concluded that the threat of criminal prosecution for making a false statement can inhibit the speaker from making true statements. It chills legitimate speech. And that speech is the exact speech that the First Amendment protects. Judge Alito also had an opinion. The opinion least protective of speech was this one. His dissent recognized that there are broad areas in which any attempt by the state is unacceptable dangerous to this. But it is perilous to permit the state to be the arbiter of truth, right? That is the opposite of what we want. So they make the argument there's a broad consensus here. There is unanimous consensus that widely disputed social, political, and historical questions, i.e. matters of public concern, are matters that are protected by the First Amendment. And this is great, okay? So this is gonna give the Supreme Court something to latch onto. So you see what they've done here, kind of this matters of public concern thing, and they're wrapping all of this. They say here, Justice Alito, right? Let's endorse this new concept here. Alito's discussion demonstrates that such claims are protected by the First Amendment, especially when the government says they're false. They're even more protected. The government comes out and says, oh no, absolutely, that's not true at all. That's the whole point of the First Amendment, is to challenge that. So when all of Trump's own government comes to him and says this is the situation, he can reject that just like he can in any other situation. Hey, Trump, you should sign this bill. No, I'm not going to do it. Hey, Trump, you should invade this country. No, not going to do it. Hey, Trump, you should concede the election. No, I'm not going to do it. Go do what I've ordered you to do. And he can come out and say, no, oh, this was all rigged, especially when his own government says it. So claims about the integrity of the election, including claims that the election was, quote, rigged, stolen, and or tainted by outcome determinative fraud, every one of those statements are fully protected by the First Amendment, regardless of the government's view of their truth or falsity. Because if the government could say that's not true, you're not allowed to say that, they could indict you for anything that they deem to be false. So otherwise, it would be perilous to permit the state to be the arbiter of truth. Now, this conclusion that the First Amendment fully protects opinions and claims on widely disputed issues like 2020 elections draws from other of the most basic principles of First Amendment jurisprudence. Here, these claims constitute one, everything that's happening here. They are Trump's core political speech, which is at the crux of the First Amendment. They're also matters of enormous public concern. And they say that if in this situation, because they're core political speech about matters of enormous public concern, any suppression of those statements would constitute forbidden viewpoint discrimination.
discrimination. And so you can think about discrimination, let's just use the word discrimination, or let's say regulation. The government might be able to regulate certain speech conduct, but not others. And a lot of the times you can distinguish this by either content or context. So for example, you might not be able to blow a bullhorn out in front of City Hall at two in the morning legally, right? There might be a time, manner, and place restriction about where you can protest, what you can do, so that you're not creating a ruckus in the middle of a neighborhood protesting and rallying, right? There might be noise ordinance and things like that. That's all legitimate because you're not saying Trump can't talk about that or this group can't talk about this. If you said that only pro-lifers are not allowed to blow bullhorns in the middle of the road, but everyone else can, that would be a content-based restriction. So the context is around where are you, you know, what time of day is it, and that type of stuff. But when they get into viewpoints, right, when you just say Trump can't question an election, that's not context. That is content. That's his opinion. And as the president, he's entitled to them. In fact, he was elected to give them to us. And the reason many of us voted for him, or one of them, was because of that. So they say, Your Honor, look, it's pretty obvious, okay? The things that Trump said are clearly speech that is being done on matters of public concern. Matters concerning public affairs is more than just simply self-expression. It's the essence of self-government. And this is why also Chutkin's gag order, right? As we go through this, like all of this can also apply to the gag order itself, not just the entire prosecution. So they say here, speech on public issues occupies the highest rung of the hierarchy on First Amendment values, and it's entitled to special protection. That comes from a U.S. Supreme Court case in 2011, saying that speech deals with matters of public concern when it can be fairly considered as relating to political concern of the community, or when it's subject to legitimate news interest, or when it's subject to the general interest and value of concern of the public. Does Trump contesting the election fall within all of those categories? I'd certainly say so. They say here, indeed, such speech constitutes core political speech. And the First Amendment, when we're talking about this type of speech, is at its zenith. So if you put speech on a spectrum, when it's core political speech, man, that is like ultra strong. You are force fielded up. But if you're making a threat, you're not as protected, right? And you go through the Brandenburg test. Is it imminent? Is it likely to incite violence and those things? And if you run through that test, then it falls out the scale of protection. But if it's questionable, right, it gets closer onto that end. You know, I don't know. But this is in a very special category. They say, we also know that attempts to prohibit or criminalize claims based on political disputes, so Trump says it was rigged, therefore that's illegal, inevitably target speech on the basis of viewpoints, which is the least tolerable of First Amendment violations. Another Supreme Court case, this one from 1995, saying when the government targets not subject matter, but particular views taken by speakers, the violation of the First Amendment is all the more blatant. Viewpoint discrimination is thus an egregious form of content discrimination. And the government, this is quote, must abstain from regulating speech when the specific motivating ideology or the opinion or the perspective of the speaker is the rationale for the restriction. So because Trump was challenging the election, his speech is even more powerful. You have to have a really good reason for saying that's illegal and that's criminal. And up until this time in American history, it has never been criminal. So the fact that the indictment alleges that the speech at issue was supposedly according to the prosecution false, they said, no, no, we said it's false. Therefore, they say it makes no difference. Under the First Amendment, each individual American participating in the free marketplace of ideas, not the federal government, decides for him or herself what is true or false. We get to pick. They say our constitutional tradition stands against the idea that we need a ministry of truth. Otherwise, there would be no limiting principle. But Jack Smith, deranged thug, and his indictment attempts to criminalize core political speech and political advocacy. But this indictment does not merely criminalize conduct with a small incidental impact on protected speech. No. Instead, this indictment directly targets core protected speech and activity. They're not just saying, you know, Trump did something bad and they're, you know, he might, let's say, you know, a murder or something like that. And that because he's being charged with a murder, which resulted, you know, in a dead person, that there's some ancillary collateral consequence for his free speech rights. No. They're saying that his exercise of free speech was the murder. Okay, that's like the body of the crime. How can you possibly say that? For this reason, it is categorically invalid. You can't charge somebody for this. They say, quote, this one from another U.S. Supreme Court case, 1972, says clearly government has no power to restrict such activity because of its message. That's what Jack Smith is trying to do here. So for similar reasons, the indictment is invalid, gone, under any level of scrutiny. As noted above, the indictment imposes viewpoint-based restrictions on core political speech on matters of the highest public concern with extremely 
severe penalty. And thus, if any scrutiny applies, it is the strictest form of scrutiny. Now let's pause for a quick minute. When we talk about whether the government violates your constitutional rights, we always ask ourselves very roughly, what did the government do? What was the action of the government? And how do we review the action? What rules do we apply to that conduct? So in criminal court, for example, what are the rules? Well, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. That leads to a conviction. The government shows it was done beyond a reasonable doubt, conviction. If not, no conviction. Okay, those are the rules. For constitutional issues, we have three different sets of rules. It gets a little more complicated. So we have what's called rational basis review, which is actually the lowest standard. Then we have intermediate scrutiny. Then we have what's called strict scrutiny. And depending on what the government is trying to impose upon you and impede, we ask ourselves, what level of scrutiny do we jump into? Is it rational basis? Is it intermediate scrutiny? Or is it strict scrutiny? And when you're talking about a constitutional right, the default is up to strict scrutiny because it's a constitutional right. Now, if you say something like, you know, I have a right not to pay my speeding ticket or something under the constitution. That's not really a constitutional right. You know, driving is a privilege. It's not a right. And you contract with the state to get a license. And so you've got a speeding ticket. So you got to pay your ticket. And if you don't want to do that and you file a constitutional thing, you're going to go to civil court and they're going to say, well, civil speeding tickets, they're allowed. States have the right to regulate themselves. And so we're not going to say that it's been on your constitutional right to drive. And so therefore, in a rational basis review will be appropriate and you're not, your constitutional rights are not violated, pay your ticket, you know, something like that. So here, this is a core protected First Amendment activity. This is political free speech. So it obviously has to go to the strictest form of scrutiny, which is very high, like extremely high. But regardless, the prosecution cannot show any interest, let alone a compelling or substantial one in punishing such First Amendment protected activity in order to meet that rule of strict scrutiny. The prosecution has no valid interest at all in silencing disfavored viewpoints or preventing people from advocating disfavored viewpoints to other government officials. This indictment is precisely tailored to violate free speech rights, not narrowly tailored to avoid them, which is what the law says. The law says that in order for them to under strict scrutiny to be allowed to violate your constitutional rights, it has to be basically absolutely necessary for the government. Like there's nothing else they can do at all. And what the action is, it's the most restrictive. It's narrowly tailored to be least violating. Okay. So it's going to minimize the constitutional violation to the maximum extent possible. But he's saying it's not doing any of that. Okay. Literally it's orchestrated to specifically violate his free speech. Now this is the antithesis of narrow tailoring. So it fails. Finally, if the indictment validly applies the language of the statute, that renders the statute both on unconstitutional as applied and unconstitutional on its face under the First Amendment over breadth doctrine. And so under their interpretation, the statute sweeps in the criminalization of large amounts of pure speech, and thus it suffers from over breadth that is not only real, but substantial as well. And so you can see now they're going to get into the meat and potatoes. So we're going to fast forward through some of this and just see what's here. First Amendment, obviously, they say extends to statements advocating for the government to act. And they give us another case called McDonald. We see here some excerpts, this conclusion from McDonald. So we're going into analysis and application. They say here, the first amendment also does not permit the government to prosecute a citizen for claiming that the election was stolen. They say here, the prosecution cannot criminalize claims of the presidential election being stolen. And it cannot seek to impose its view on anybody who thinks that way. Claims about the 2020, including claims that it was rigged or stolen, implicate all the first amendment amendment fundamental principles in this country. And so if they can prosecute Trump for saying it was rigged, can they prosecute all of us? This is especially true because claims of 2020 that it was rigged or tainted by fraud, these don't involve easily verifiable facts. Okay. Other cases, you just know what's true or not, but many millions of reasonable people, including yours truly here, believe that the 2020 election was unfairly rigged against president Trump. And you can just point to the Hunter Biden laptop cover up. You can point to the FBI collusion and censorship censorship scam that was in place. You can point to the CIA and the 51 so-called intelligence experts who signed a letter to lie to all of us who were colluding literally with Anthony Blinken from the Biden campaign, who he then made secretary of state. The whole thing was rigged. They had the COVID scoreboard death counter on every day. Look at Trump, ah, more dead people, Trump, Trump, dead people. Then as soon as the election's over, they changed it to green and it's the, how many people got the jab, right? Oh, Joe Biden's bringing the jab to America. Now what the heck is going on here? So the whole thing was rigged. And by the way, that doesn't even get into all of the election rules that were changed that we covered here on this channel. I can't even tell you how many lawsuits we covered in the run up to 2020. We were screaming from the rooftops that they kept changing the rules due to COVID. They waived 
signature requirements. They waived all sorts of other registrations, moved deadlines back, authorized ballot box collections, the whole deal. So yeah, there's a lot of us that say that there were a lot of problems with the election. Now there is an abundant public evidence providing a reasonable basis for these opinions. I just listed some of them. What is critical is that how one interprets this evidence depends on one's deep-seated political views. True, and I would also say reality, including one's trust in government institutions, zero here, and government officials, among others. Now, different people will draw different inferences from what they see. But guess what? That's what the First Amendment permits. That's what we're supposed to do is have these debates. So this unconstitutional dynamic on the face of the indictment itself is showing this is unconstitutional. It repeatedly says that Trump knowingly made false claims of election fraud. But in every case, the indictment's basis for the allegation that Trump's claims were knowingly false is that, quote, a member of the political establishment assured Trump that they were false, okay? So we have to ask ourselves, right? They're gonna come, Trump stole the election, insurrected America. No, 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 okay, calm down, psycho hysterical person. Tell me specifically what it was, what conduct? In the indictment, because they gotta prove the indictment and it's gotta be specific conduct. So Trump's defense is saying, look, here's what they said. Every indictment that says Trump made a knowingly false statement, how did Trump know it? How did they read his mind? How was it knowingly? A member of the political establishment told him so. That's great. Just because somebody tells you something doesn't mean that you believe that. So under the First Amendment, Trump and his supporters are entitled to mistrust the word of the government and draw their own inferences from the fact that I think we've been proven true. And neither the federal government nor the judicial branch may dictate what President Trump and others are required to believe or to say about this hotly disputed political question. Now, the government, they can come to their own conclusions, of course. It can hold hearings and conduct investigations and it can establish its viewpoint. It may insist that the opinions of others, including Trump, are wrong or baseless, as they did, or stupid, or they can even say they're false and malicious. But the government may not require Americans to subscribe to its views or to punish them for expressing or advocating. Now, to do so violates the First Amendment. And under the First Amendment, the question of whether 2020 was stolen from Trump must be decided in the marketplace of ideas, not in criminal prosecutions. And so this case should be dismissed. We also know that Trump was tried in the Senate and he was acquitted. And under our system of separated powers, the executive branch lacks authority under Jack Smith to second guess the decision of the legislative branch, Congress, on an issue that lies within the legislative branch's exclusive purview. Congress made a decision on this. The executive branch cannot usurp them. We have separation of powers for a reason. They've already come to their conclusion. The Constitution's plain text, structural principles of separation of powers, the principles of double jeopardy, they stop the executive branch from trying to recharge and retry a president who's already been impeached and subsequently acquitted. He's already had the trial. After a party has been convicted in the Senate, then they shall be held liable to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment. So impeached in the House, trial in the Senate. If you're convicted, which Trump never was, then you can be indicted and prosecuting according to law. But because it's a political position, I deal with it politically first. Now, because the Constitution says that, Your Honor, it's all well-founded and it reflects the original meaning that we've seen elsewhere in the Federalist Papers. And they're going back to some other arguments. Now they say here, in this case, President Trump is not a party who has been convicted in an impeachment trial by the Senate. He was impeached in January 21 by the House on articles arising from the same issues in this indictment. They impeached him after January 6. Among other things, in the articles of impeachment, they put this in here, that Trump repeatedly issued false statements asserting that the election results were the product of widespread fraud and should not be accepted by the American people and that Trump made false claims in a speech and that he engaged in prior efforts, whatever that is, to subvert and obstruct the certification of their results, including a phone call and he threatened the integrity of the democratic system. And guess what, Judge Chutkin? The indictment here rests on the very same alleged facts, all the same. President Trump was already acquitted after a trial in the Senate and therefore he is not a party who's been convicted under the constitution and therefore he's not subject to being indicted for the same course of conduct. It's political 
role because Congress impeached him for it and tried him for it. And to avoid partisan criminal hack prosecutors, our founders required a much bigger threshold to actually impeach somebody and convict them in the Senate. That did not happen. So they don't get the opportunity to just charge him in a hundred different jurisdictions until they get a conviction now. Trump is immune under double jeopardy, essentially. Presidential double jeopardy, if you want to call it that. So in sum, under the Constitution, the executive branch, including the prosecution, because the DOJ and Jack Smith belong to Joe Biden, they lack the authority to second guess the acquittal that was already made by the Senate. This is good. And the body to which the Constitution explicitly entrusts this authority to do so violates the impeachment clause and the principles of separation of power by unlawfully encroaching in the authority that's already been vested to Congress. And so because this is barred, the Fifth Amendment comes into play as well. Double jeopardy applies. No person shall be subject to the same offense twice. And we've got a separation of powers issue. And also Trump didn't know that he was going to be indicted by partisan prosecutor hacks. Here's what they say. They say this indictment charges that President Trump with crimes arising from his political advocacy on matters of public concern in the middle of a disputed election. And quite frankly, Trump was inspired by, and he was acting fully consistent with other examples in other contested elections. For example, a long history in our nation, dating back to 1800. We had elections 1800, 1824, 1876, 1960, 2000 with Bush, 2004, 2016 with Trump and all the Democrats screaming from the rooftop on that one, among many others, of disputing the outcome of close presidential elections, publicly claiming everybody comes out, that the results are tainted by fraud, everyone files legal actions, that everyone's lobbying, everyone is trying to not certify, and everyone's disputing the results, organizing alternate and contingent slates of electors. In other words, all the chief alleged acts in the indictment, every single thing that you're charging him for, they all have a long historical pedigree in American electoral history. And they've all been long decided in the political arena. President Trump is the first person to face criminal charges for such core political behavior as disputing the outcome of an election. He is charged, moreover, under statutes that have facially nothing to do with his alleged conduct and whose language the special prosecutor stretches beyond recognition. As a result, Trump could not possibly have received fair notice that this was criminal and this should be dismissed as a violation of his due process rights to receive proper notice under the United States Constitution. And so we can see they continue to give us some more historical precedent for that. And they give us closing paragraph. They say, at the time of the allegations in this indictment, the only relevant precedent from 2000 treated post-election challenges as lawful and actions listed in the indictment, the things that they say were criminal, they'd been performed in a number of other elections, 1800, 24, 76, 60, without any criminal charges. Scores of people have been involved in similar conduct over the years of American history and none, not one, has faced criminal prosecution in the last 234 years. On these facts, at best, men of common intelligence must necessarily guess if President Trump's conduct violated the statutes and thus the due process clause is violated. Saying that the court, therefore, Judge Chutkin, you should dismiss this indictment for violating Trump's constitutional rights and dismiss it with prejudice, meaning you can't come back with this. It's done and over and gone. Submitted, love this argument by John F. Loro. I think that what we saw from Todd Blanche and these guys is very good. And these are the types of issues that the Supreme Court is ultimately going to need to weigh in on. I mean, I think that these are the right arguments. I think that if you just take their favored outcome and you just extrapolate that as a rule and everybody can just charge prosecutor, a politician, we go to a very bad place pretty quickly in this country, which is maybe where they want to take us. But the founders had some logic on this, right? We wanted to deal with our political prosecutions politically. Trump made a political statement about a political election. It was resolved politically in Congress. He was acquitted of that. And now they're trying to do it again. So that I think is really where the fractures to our country and to our government come into play. It's much more serious than anything Trump has done. And so we're going to continue to go through these motions. We've got a lot more to get to. We'll come back and hit the motion to dismiss on statutory grounds from Donald Trump as we go through the mother load of the motions to dismiss and other filings. So please make sure you're subscribed, my friends. Invite a friend or family member, somebody you know or love to come and join us because this case is just heating up. We've been waiting for this document drop and it is here. And so we're going to continue to cover this case and all of the other Trump sagas. And so we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one.